a quick and short bio of Murabi Saab. So Murabi Saab serves as the associate editor of the Review of Religions, having graduated from Jamia um, Ahmedia UK, the Institute of Modern Languages and Theology. He's also the Imam of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and regularly appears as a panelist on the MTA International and Voice of Islam um, stations, answering a whole range of questions um, about Islam. Today, he's here to talk to us about, you know, the proofs from the Quran and also the writings of the Khulafa. Um, Rabi Saab is gonna speak for approximately 45 minutes after which we'll have um, you know, 15 minutes for questions and answers. As Murabi Saab um, you know, gives his talk, please feel free to pop your questions into the chat um, and during the question and answer session, we will attend um, to them. So I'm not gonna take any more time, but I will kindly hand over to Murabi Saab for the talk. So Murabi Saab, over to you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Nahmadu wa nasalli ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala abdihi al-masihi al-maw'ud. Amma ba'du fa'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I'm just going to quickly uh, share my screen. Can uh, Rizwan and Sandasab, can you see this? Yes. Yes. I can yeah. see your screen. Okay, great. Um, So, um, first of all, Jazakma for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, when Rizwan Saib um, approached me and said he, uh, he wanted me to speak on something about the Quran, um, the first thing that came to mind was immediately the tafsir of the Holy Quran by the Promised Messiah, alayhi salam, and Hazrat Muslim, radiallahu anhu. The reason is because the Promised Messiah on countless occasions said that he has been taught the verities and the beauties of the Holy Quran from God Almighty Himself. And in fact, even Hazrat Muslim Aud in the opening of uh, in Surah Fatah, in the first chapter, when he writes this tafsir, he says that an angel came to me and taught me the commentary of the Holy Quran. Now, this is a big claim, and this is a claim which no other Mufassir in the past, or, or, or Hazrat Muslim Aud wasn't a Mufassir, but he was a Khalifa of God, but no Mufassir in the past has said that. I am writing this with the help of God, or God Almighty has told me this, 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 or an angel is teaching me this. So this is a, a, a big, big claim. And hopefully through this, I will um, present the, the tafsir of Hazrat Muslim Aud. I mean, you could present a tafsir of everything that he's written, but I've just specifically chosen this incident because it's one that the Mufassirin in the past have uh, got significantly or you know, drastically have a different view of it as compared to uh, what, what the Ahmadiyya perspective is. And again, that and the, the, the Muslim Ummah take the tafsir from there. But we're very fortunate that we have the tafsir of the likes of the Promised Messiah, the, the Khulafa with us to explain to us the real meanings of these verses. So that's why I chose this subject. So the verses under discussion is from chapter 27, verses 19 to 20. So it's, uh, I'll read it quickly. Uh, can this, um, sorry, it's going to remove this. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> and it says, Hatta ida atau ala wadin naml. Alat namla, ya ayuhan nam, udukulu masakinakum, la yahtimanakum Sulaiman wa junuduhu, wa hum la yashurun. For the bassama dahikam min kauliha. وقال رب أوزعني أن أشكر نعمتك التي أنمت علي وعلى والدي وأن أعمل صالحا ترضاه وأدخلني برحمتك في عبادك الصالحين and that means that when they came to the valley of Naml, a woman from the tribe of the Naml said O ye Naml, go into your habitations lest Solomon and his host crush you unknowingly and the second verse is thereupon he smiled laughing at her words and said my lord grant me the will and power to be grateful for thy favor which thou hast bestowed upon me and upon my parents and to do such good works as would please thee and ad admit me by thy mercy among thy righteous servants so these are the two verses about prophet solomon going to the valley of the ants 
And before I go into detail what the Mufassirin say and what um, is our perspective, it's important to know the, the context of this verse. So the context of this verse is, uh, this, these are the two previous verses, so verses 17 and 18. It says that, وَوَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانُ دَاوُودَ وَقَالَ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ عُلِّمْنَا مَنْتِقَ الطَّيْرِ وَأُوْتِيْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ إِنَّ هَذَا لَهُوَ الْفَضْلُ الْمُبِينَ وَحُشِرَ لِسُلَيْمَانَ جُنُودُهُ Some random line appeared. So, وَحُشِرَ لِسُلَيْمَانَ جُنُودُهُ مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنْسِ وَالطَّيْرِ فَهُمْ يُوزَعُونَ Which means that Solomon was heir to David, and he said, O ye people, we have been taught the language of birds, and we have had everything bestowed upon us. This, indeed, is God's manifest grace. And the second verse is, and there were gathered together unto Solomon and his hosts of jinn and men and birds, and they were formed into separate divisions. This is where the story starts from. So the Mufassirin have taken this particular point, that we have been taught the language of the birds, to mean that this is a miracle of Solomon, and that he was taught the language of birds, and he could speak to birds. Uh, and I'll tell you, there's some some really crazy uh, tafasir, um, what the Mufassirin have done. And from there, this whole idea develops about Solomon speaking to ants, etc., etc., etc. So that's why I've mentioned this context. For example, <clears throat> so Imam Razi, I've just only focused on four of the very, very famous Mufassirin of the past, Imam Razi, Dabari, Ibn Kathir, and Zamakhshiri. Now, all of them hold the view that Solomon walked past a valley of ants, ants as in the, the insect, ants. And uh, some actually even go on to say that uh, the ants were, like for example, Dabari says, the ants were the size of wolves. I mean, without any sort of uh, uh, proof or anything, that in those, in those days, or that specific colony of ants were the size of wolves. As a Muslim world says that some even commentators have said that they were the size of chickens. And some say that they were the size of like sheep. So this, this is some of the different views of the commentators. Ibn Kathir even says that, you know, this is a blessing of God Almighty that Solomon could speak to birds. And it's, it wasn't given to anyone before, before this. And um, as, as it was mentioned that birds were part of Solomon's army, whenever they would travel and it would get too hot, so the birds would shade Solomon from the sun. And even later, when I speak briefly about uh, Hudhud, um, which they say is, or again, another bird, um, it says that, you know, I, Solomon says that I will punish him. And then that they believe to mean that he would pluck their feathers, but more to that later. And uh, again, most of the Mufassirin are saying that don't think this is improbable because Allah the Almighty is Al-Qadir. He has the power to do everything. So therefore, if Solomon can speak to birds, there, there's, there's, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, that's, that was a miracle of, of Solomon. So that's in a nutshell what the, the, uh, the Muslim Ummah, or you could say the, you know, the, the, the Muslims believe that Solomon actually walked past a, a valley of ants. And to stop him uh, in destroying this colony, Solomon stopped and the, the, the female, one of the female ants told all the, its comrades that, you know, go back to your homes, otherwise Solomon's army will trample all over you. And then when Solomon heard this, he laughed. And then he offered this prayer, which is quite strange because there doesn't seem to be any, any comparison or any bravery in a human destroying uh, an, an ant or not destroying an ant, um, there's just no context. There's no comp there's no comparison. So, I mean, what does this all mean? So, as a Muslim, radiallahu anhu, says that just as there are metaphors in in different languages, this was also a metaphor starting from the whole where, where I mentioned that ulimna mantiqatir, and this is a very important part of the whole discussion. We were taught language, the language of the birds does not mean that Solomon was taught language of physical birds. Uh, I mean, 
it'll be quite interesting because to this day or in current in the current day there's about 10,000 different species of birds and each one of them communicates in a different way some have you, you know through the tone of of their singing or their squeak some don't even communicate with with that some actually communicate by flapping their wings and causing mini sonic booms underneath their wings to get the message across so was solomon taught all of the, the, the these languages these tones and everything that's just 10,000 species today you know god only knows how many species have been extinct for the past you know 3 4000 years so all of these things are it it, it makes it very very I mean, it makes it into a, a complete fable, if you want to say. But the Quran has specifically mentioned this entire point. That's the that Solomon was taught the language of the birds, and he walked past a valley of um, ants. If Allah is mentioning something in the Quran, it means that it has some significance. It doesn't mention anything for the sake of mentioning. <coughs> sorry, <coughs> it doesn't mention things for the sake of mentioning a, a story. So as a Muslim, I'll say that just as there are metaphors in every language, this also entire incident is, is a metaphor. And the metaphors actually exist even inside the Quran, if you think about it, where Allah the Almighty says, Yadullahi fawqa aidihim, that Allah's hand was over their hands. It doesn't mean that Allah the Almighty has hands, physical hands like ours. Or that when it says, uh, istawa ala al-arsh, that God Almighty sat on the throne. It doesn't mean that he has legs or, or arms as a physical body and he sits on a, a throne of marble. Well, actually, some people, well, some sects of uh, Muslims do actually believe that, they, you know, there's physically an arsh up there somewhere. Anyway, we won't go into that. But as a, as a Muslim, I'll even give the example of, um, in Urdu, we, we say, which, if you literally translate, means the eye has sat down. Obviously, the eyes, you know, can't sit down, etc. It's, it's a metaphor or a muhavra to say that the eye has become damaged. Similarly, this ulimna mantiq al-tayr means that the, the reason why the uh, birds have been used is that tara yatiru in the Arabic language means anything that soars, which is why a plane in the Arabic language is called ta'ira. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Hence, because it, it flies. So it doesn't mean physical birds, but it means those people who saw in the spiritual realm and are the beloved or chosen ones of God because divine knowledge comes down from the heavens. And obviously the, the primary recipients of that knowledge are those who are most closest to it. Hence why Allah the Almighty uses this metaphor of birds. Even the promised Messiah was given a revelation. Meaning thousands of people are under your wings. The promised Messiah didn't have physical wings. But it, again, it's, it's to show that this it's a metaphor. Why? Why though? Why is it that God has used this term and why? what is the significance of this? What does it mean by spiritual knowledge? It, spiritual knowledge here means that knowledge which is sent down by God in the form of revelations, visions, dreams, true dreams, knowledge of the unseen, knowledge of God's word, all of the things which are given to prophets. So this statement, is a clarification or a vindication of Prophet Solomon. Because in the Bible, Prophet Solomon, the Jews and Christians hold Solomon to be very wise. They hold him to be a king. But they do not hold him to be a prophet of God or to be someone who was a, you know, a chosen person of God as we believe, as Muslims believe. For, I'll give you an example as well. It says in, in Kings 1 that Solomon had hundreds of wives and hundreds of concubines, and his wives made him uh, neglect the worship of God and turned him towards polytheism, as in idolatry. These are just some of the some of the or characteristics described by the Bible of Solomon, a prophet of God. So this statement means that we are taught this, the same language of the righteous people, meaning prophets. This statement show, is, a, is a declaration or a vindication of Solomon 
to the Jews and Christians saying that he, Solomon, and David, his father, were both prophets of God, righteous people of God, and not just a king. So this verse actually expands on th this entire point. So to vindicate Solomon and to, to remove this blemish upon him and his father, for David as well, that they were they were righteous people, they were prophets of God, not just kings. So that's why this whole, um, uh, I had to mention this context of As for Solomon's army consisting of jinn, humans and birds, that's a completely different topic. I, I won't be able to get into that because that will, the topic of jinn in itself is such a, an amazing topic that that could be a separate lecture altogether. The, the Ahmadiyya perspective of jinn is incredible. But I'll give you just one example of what as the Muslim I would say is that even in this um, in this this verse, the Shushan al Sulaiman al Junuduhu min al Jin, that Solomon had jinns in his army, meaning you know supernatural um, beings, um, and they used to weave carpets, magic carpets. And I'm telling you this for all from the actual tafasir here that they used to weave carpets, um, a bit like Aladdin, Aladdin and the, the the magic carpet, and they would take four jinn would be on each corner of the carpet, and they would take Solomon, Solomon and they would travel around the world. Um, so Hazrat Muslim says that it's very strange that jinn actually are mentioned with reference to Moses and to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. So the Hazrat Muslim says it's very strange that the jinn of Solomon were so powerful that they would take him around the world. But the jinn that came to the Holy Prophet were so weak that they never ended up helping him in any time or aspect of his life. Not a single part time in his life you see that a jinn came and helped the Holy Prophet. You know, he had to escape from Mecca under, you know, his life was in danger. No one helped him. He was in danger in every single battle that he faced. No jinn came to his aid. So it's very strange that Solomon, the jinn that were part of Solomon's army, were extremely powerful, but the jinn that came to the Holy Prophet was so weak that they couldn't even help him. Anyway, this is just just one point out of the the beautiful commentary that he's given for this verse and for the whole concept of of jinn. But I, uh, like I said, I can't get into that. that's a completely separate topic. <clears throat> one aspect that the Mufassirin say that this where this says that la yahtimannakum Sulaiman junuduhu that lest Solomon and his host crush you, unlearn you, or trample over you. So this is another thing that they take that um, because it was a colony of ants, uh, they didn't, uh, lest Solomon and his uh, army crush you under their feet, go back into your homes. This was the, the edict from the one of the um, one of the Nemalites, or as they say, the ants. But actually, la yahtimannakum comes from the Arabic root word hatama yahtimu, which means to shatter, smash, wreck, demolish, absolutely smash to smithereens, basically. And for any budding physicists that are here today, Hatama in form two actually means to split atoms. So they say Tahtim al dharra means uh, nuclear fission. Anyway, that's just a side point. But a word that you would have known from the same root is Hatim in the, the, the semicircular part of the, of the Kaaba, which was originally part of the Kaaba, but because it was destroyed, Hence, it is called Hatim. And again, in the Quran, it comes as um, uh, Al Hutama in Surah Humaza means a crushing torment. It's, it refers to the fire of hell because it will absolutely smash a person or destroy a person. So it doesn't mean, La Yahtimannakum doesn't mean so that lest Solomon and his army trample all over you. It means lest Solomon and his army absolutely destroy you or crush you. Wahum la yashurun. This point is very important. Unknowingly, in a, in a state where they are unmindful of you, because I'll, I'll come to this at the end. So, why then is it that uh, why then is it that we find that the commentators are have erred on this on this part and what are the proofs of the Ahmadiyya perspective that this Wadi and Naml was actually a tribe of people of humans and not a colony of ants 
let's look at some of the the proofs that we have or some of the proofs that as a muslim old has presented and uh one of uh, uh, an interesting thing he says is that it's strange that every day a person walks in the streets or wherever they especially in, like in the jungle or something and they never look below their feet that they might crush an ant or in, in one's lifetime you can probably crush you know hundreds and thousands you know unknowingly or or no one willingly stamps on anything right on, a, on an animal but why is it that this specific you know mention has been uh has been recorded in the holy quran for for all times it is it can't be and you know just just it can't just be an ant it, I, I can't stress this enough that it can't just be a colony of ants it has to be something more significant before i get to that ibn kathir actually uh, some of the so the commentators when they say that this is a colony of ants they actually go into detail about saying why uh, you know what it was where they lived um they even mentioned the tribe names of the ants some have gone on to mention tribe names of ants um and they say they ibn kathir mentions a, a very interesting incident he says that it hadn't rained for a long time so solomon um said that we'll go out and pray. He, he writes this in his tafsir, that we will go out and pray. And uh, on the way, he saw an ant with both of its uh, front legs raised in the air, and it was praying, oh Lord, we are also your creation. Don't, don't deprive us of this rain. So don't deprive us of rain. So Solomon heard this, and because as according to this, he, he can understand, or according to the, the non-Ahmadi non Fasirin, he could understand ants, the language of ants, he he uh, turned back and said that we don't need to we don't need to pray anymore because the the ants prayer is is enough for us. Uh, so the, the Mufassirin have actually put down entire accounts backing up their the, their claim. So the, what has a Muslim all says here is that it's interesting that his actual wording is that I am at a loss to understand where the Mufassirin have understood that birds and ants are the same thing. He says that, okay, let's, let's hypothetically speaking, assume that Solomon was actually taught the language of birds, physical birds. How is it possible that he could understand what an ant said? That doesn't really make sense. So that, that is, is quite interesting. So then he goes on to put his proofs of why this was actually colony of people and not um, ants. And one of the main or easiest things to understand with is from the pronouns used by Allah the Almighty here. It says, Ya masakinakum la yahtimannakum. So in the Arabic language, you cannot use the masculine pronoun for a non-human. By default, let me put it, let me reverse it. Sorry. By default. All non-humans non, uh, um, will take the feminine singular pronoun. Or in classical, that's the modern standard version. In classical text, you can get the, the plural feminine as well. Point being, any non-human object, animal, etc., anything that is non-human will take the Arabic form of feminine singular or feminine plural. It will not take the masculine. But in all of the in this verse, all of the pronouns used are masculine. Udukhulu, this is a masculine plural command. Go in enter, all of you. Masakinakum, your habitations. Kum. Again, it's a masculine pronoun. Masculine plural pronoun. La yahtimanna kum. Kum again. So what it should have been, if it was actually referring to ants, it would have been Udukhuli or Udkhulna. Both, and I've got proof for the fact that it's pronoun feminine uh, plural as well. It's mentioned in the Quran as well. Um, again, it should have been masakina fi o masakina kunna. So it should have been this had it been a colony of ants. What are the, some of the other proofs that they were actually people in Tajul Urus, which is what a very very famous um, Arabic lexicon? Wadi and Namal is described as a settlement in the Levant situated between Asqalan and Jibreen. Again, Wadi Namal is mentioned in Mu'jim al-Buldan, Taqweem al-Buldan, Nelson's encyclopedia um, under the word Palestine. There's a whole map of the Old Testament 
<coughs> sorry, excuse me. And there is it's recorded there as well. And recently, I was just searching on the web. Even Wadi and Namal is one of life's oldest neighborhoods. So you can't say that Wadi and Namal or this this name doesn't exist. It's, it exists. And the reason, um, and well, the reason I'll get to, but the 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 fact is that Wadi and Namal was a settlement. This is according to our perspective, on the route from when Solomon was going with his army to Yemen, and so from Jerusalem to Yemen. All of this area, the Levant, all this, uh, even even actually Daif uh, um, in in Saudi Arabia of today, even that's on the route to to Yemen. So again, as a Muslim world hasn't specified where exactly it was, but has given all these proofs that there actually is a place called Wadi and Namal. Which route Solomon took, we don't know, but along this route, Wadi and Namal was a settlement of people who, when Solomon passed with his majestic army, uh, said something which is really, really uh, profound. And uh, it'll, it'll all jig the, the jigsaw will, will um, fit together. But before that, why is it that God Almighty chose to use ants? Again, in any language, if you have um, a descriptive language, especially the, the Quran is full of metaphors, and it it adds to a, a story. It gives it gives it eloquence. It gives it a, a beauty. And also, if you think about it, ants are extremely organized, highly efficient. You know all the 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 traits of ants. But there are very, some very interesting points. Ants, by the way, don't actually have ears. So how um, you know Solomon was communicating to the the ants? It, it beats me. I mean, they pick up, you know, vibrations through the through an organ below their knee. Um, but ants, which is an important part here, why perhaps Allah the Almighty is used um, to refer to ants, is that it's the ruler is a queen. It's it's a female, as opposed to, uh, as in other animal species, that the male is the, is the dominant figure. But in ants, like bees as well, the queen is the is the ruler of the colony. So, the Wadi and Namal was ruled by a queen. Hence, why it says, if I quickly go back to the the wording, "Qalat Namlatun," a female ant said. Hence, the ruler of the Wadi of Namal issued this decree that go back into your homes, lest Solomon or his army destroy you. So that's why, again, one of the reasons why Allah the Almighty could have used this. If you are describing someone, you describe their characteristics, like this Wadi and Namal. Could have been high, you know, highly, a highly organized community. Someone who was, you know, highly efficient and ruled by a queen. And it's not uncommon for Arab names, even today, to be named after um, animals. So you, in the past, you have the Banu Kalb, uh, Banu Layth, Banu Asad. All of these are, you know, are named after animals. And the, you know, names such as Fahad, Shaheen, Yamama. Even Abdul Rahman bin Sakhar, radiallahu anhu, which you would all know as Abu Huraira, the father of the cats, is, is very famous. Uh, I mean, Abu Huraira narrated, you know, countless ahadith. You would never know his name, but you know Abu Huraira because that was his title. He's known by Abu Huraira. So it's not uncommon for people to be described by animal uh, or named after animals. So why is it? Then, almost, almost wrapping up, don't worry, not, not too much uh, further to go. Why is it that the, the queen of Wadi and Namal issued this decree to go back to your homes, lest Solomon and his army crush you unknowingly? The fact is that when it's in line with military tactics, if if a colony knows that a ruler is about to attack and that ruler is pious, is righteous, is known for his honor, if they stay in their homes, they will be saved. And I'll give you an example, which will you'll understand it by through this example. When the Holy Prophet وسلم, invaded Mecca in 8 Hijri, he made a decree saying, Anyone who stays in their homes 
will be in peace. There will be nothing will be done. No harm will befall them. Anyone who stays in the house of Abu Sufyan, no harm will befall him. And the people of Mecca knew if they stay in their homes, they will be at peace. The, the Holy Prophet's army will not do the, any harm to them. But that is not the case for every single ruler. And in fact, more often than not, it's not. It's, that is not the case. For example, when um, Alexander the Great invaded Egypt in the, in the siege of Tyre in 332 BC, he killed 8,000 civilians and 30,000 were sold into slavery. And many of these were women and children. Same with Hilaku Khan. When he invaded Baghdad and ransacked it completely, the, the death toll is, it varies from source to source, from Muslim source to Western source. But the minimum figure that it, they put it as is 100,000 civilians dead. When the people in Baghdad, if they stayed in their homes, it would make them no difference. Same with people in Egypt. Because these rulers, when they come, they come, loot, destroy, kill. Whether it's man, woman, children, they do not, they, without distinction, they kill anyone. But the Holy Prophet, وسلم, when he came to Makkah, issued a decree and people knew that they knew the traits of the Holy Prophet. That is why the Queen of Namal ordered the decree, or the ruler of Namal ordered the decree to stay in your homes, as Solomon and his army will never do any harm to you unknowingly. Because when you stay in your homes, that means that you do not have and you will not oppose the army. And you've already accepted de this defeat. This is the link between why this, when Solomon heard this decree, he smiled and he laughed. And he then he offered this prayer. And, and the prayer is all about shukr, gratitude to Allah the Almighty. Why? It is because Solomon was, was uh, offering thanks to Allah the Almighty for this reputation that in this far away land, in this far away colony, wherever um, this Wadi Namal was, but in a distant land away from uh, where Prophet Solomon was, his reputation preceded him, that he was a righteous king, he was, he was a righteous prophet, righteous person, and that he would not harm anyone unknowingly. Hence the words, وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ That is why when he heard that the woman said, the, the, the queen of the Wadi Namal said, stay in your homes, otherwise you will be you know, destroyed. And if you stay in your homes, you'll be safe. That's when Prophet Solomon smiled. And this, this laughing bit means that he was thankful in the sense that he was happy, not, not in hysteria, but he was actually happy that, oh Allah, I'm grateful for this blessing. And this blessing is this incredible reputation that you have given to me and to my father that and then obviously offered and uh, requested for him to be bestowed into, you know, given your special mercy and included in your special um, people. That's the link between um, this statement of the um, queen and why he offered this, this, this prayer. Otherwise, it makes no sense. If it was just simply a colony of ants, th th there was why he would be thanking God Almighty, only Allah knows. So this is the, the Ahmadiyya perspective of the, um, of the incident of Wadi al Namal. But this actually continues on, and it goes all the way to, so after, um, after these verses, it actually mentions, and Allah the Almighty beautifully continues the same use of language. It continues with the, the birds, and it uses some specific wording to show that uh, the, the very famous incident of Hudhud, which again the Mufassirin take to be mean one of Solomon's special birds, and when after this incident, when he lined up his whole army, he realized that one of the birds is missing, and it was his name was Hudhud, and and so Prophet Solomon was really angry, and he said that I will I will kill you, and the and or I will give him a you know I will slaughter him, and the wording uses la azbahanna, meaning ziba. So I will, I will slaughter him, or I will give him a, a chastising punishment. And again, Allah the Almighty has beautifully used the same sort of words that would probably seem like it's talking about 
ziba, as in killing or slaughtering of a, of a bird. Whereas as a Muslim all again says that, look, even in the Quran, with regards to the Bani Israel, it says that they used to yastahyuna nisa'akum wa uh, yudhabbihuna abna'akum wa yastahyuna nisa'akum. That they would yudhabbihuna abna'akum. They would slaughter your children. So it's not the fact that this word yudhabbihuna can only mean slaughtering for animals. It actually is in the form of used for humans as well in the Quran. So this is a whole separate um, separate. Uh, incident. I don't want to go into that because I was focusing mainly on the valley of the ants. But again, it, if you read this whole incident and you understand it from the Ahmadiyya perspective, it really enhances your your appreciation for the language of the Holy Quran and the tafsir that have been presented by the the, the Khulafa. And like I said, I've given you some just a few mufassirin and what they believe. Um, and you can make your own comparison as as to which you think is is better. So, Rizwanza, that's all I have uh, from my side. Um, so for a really fascinating talk. Um, I'll hand over to Sandasab now um, to invite any question. Sure. Um, Jazakallah, um, Rabbi Saab. Um, that was, you know, great. That was very succinct and really um, deep um, as well. It's now time for question and answers. I can't see any questions so far in the chat, but if you do have a question, um, this is the time to ask. Um, we've got about 60 people here. Um, so what might be useful is if you can use the raise hand function, and then I can call you in to ask your question. I guess that means I've, I've bored everyone then. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's, it's, um, I'm sure people people are, are posting questions here. But um, so there is a question. Um, Mariam has just posted the question, but it seems it's has come directly to me. And Mariam, I'm wondering whether you want to just unmute yourself and sort of um, ask this question directly to Murabi Saab. Assalamualaikum, Jazakallah for your great talk. Um, I was wondering why why isn't the the queen of the Namal um, mentioned as specifically as the queen or as the leader rather than just writing a woman, which can which is very like um, open for a lot of interpretation. So I don't know if you can get my question. I don't know. Yeah, I understood. It's not actually a woman. It's actually um, a female ant said. So it, nowhere in the in the verses does it say that it it doesn't refer to a um, it doesn't refer to a woman. If you if you oh, okay, because I was reading in the German translation in our from our Jamaat and it's written a woman like meaning a, a woman. But if you look at the Arabic, it says qalat namlatun, meaning a an ant said a female ant said. So the 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 beauty of the whole incident is that God Almighty could easily have just said um, Solomon walked past a valley of people and the, 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 the ruler of the of the you know of the colony said um, go to your homes it could have been that as well but the whole point is if you look at the preceding verses Allah the Almighty is speaking in metaphorical language as it is and like I said, the ulim na mantiqatay, that we've been taught the language of the birds. God Almighty could have said that Solomon and uh, David were pious prophets of God. But the whole point is it, it's, it's a whole story. Sometimes people um, take more to stories, right? It's, and the language used is according to that. That's why it says, qalat namlatun, an, an ant, a female ant said. It doesn't say oh, a woman said. I mean, that's what we have. Remember, we're, we're bound by the by the lack of depth in our languages right but the the arabic language is is far superior and it's, it's beautiful because it it's kept in context with the with the story and the wording complements it beautifully so it doesn't say a woman said it actually says an, a female ant said hence why all the mufassirin have actually taken it to mean an ant colony so that that's the whole greatness of um, Hazrat muslim uh, um the seed as well, and it shows that actually Allah the Almighty taught him because no mufassir. Look at the names that I mentioned: Ibn Kathir, Imam Razi. These are great, great mufassirin. Don't get me wrong; the 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 by no means, God forbid, 
um, you know, any second rate Mufassir, they are very, very famous, but they were not able to, you know, derive the deeper meanings of this verse. But as a Muslim, it was. Just Does that like answer it. your question? So I can see another question in the chat by Ahmed Manan. Um, Ahmed Manan, do you want to um, come off mute and ask your question? Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Zakalam Rabbi Saab, that was uh, really enlightening. Um, I had a little question around uh, the translation. So forgive my ignorance of the Arabic. Uh, on the first verse, uh, it says, um, lest Solomon and his hosts crush you unknowingly. So it says his hosts. And I, I'm just intrigued by that. Do you think that um, the host of uh, Solomon Leslam's army and himself has any connection to the Wadi and Namul tribe? You know, um, you actually asked a very, very uh, good question. And in the pre uh, process of the preparation of, for this talk, I actually was, because I've always read it in Urdu, right? Um, I rarely read the translation in English. So um, I was actually intrigued myself why um, host has, has been used here. And I will actually um, go back and check why that, that is the case, because I actually don't know myself. But from the Arabic, it's uh, Suleiman wa Junuduhu. Junud is the plural of Jundiyun, which means uh, a soldier. So Junud is his armies, like a, like a massive army. But again, the way you posed it is possible. Perhaps they stayed in, in that area. I don't know, or or maybe they had some some connection to to Wadi and Namul. I, I don't actually know. Um, like I said, this this host word I came across it for the first time when I was actually preparing for this. So. It's a good question. I can, you know, find out and get back to you, because Junud actually does mean army. So right. I, I, I share your um, intrigue in that as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, um, yeah. I, okay. Um, the, I, I, mean, I, I kept it as host because that's the official translation given by Molly Shirley Saab, and and even sure. the Frulah Khan Saab has done the same translation as well. So I'm, I'm intrigued. I'll, I will find this out, inshallah. I'll, I'll get yeah. back to you. It, it may be it may be in reference to um, the journey itself, which sort Possibly. of backs up, you know, what you were elaborating about what has um, uh, Mzim Abdul Islam uh, was referring to as well, as in the actual place. Uh, yes. Maybe maybe the way maybe the Vadi al Namal tribe was under threat somehow. Possibly, by, and they uh, and they settled there for a while or for, for for a brief time. I don't know. It's it's very possible. It's quite interesting. And remember, they, yeah. Solomon was going to Yemen, right? To Malka yeah. Sabah, right. the Queen of Sheba. So that this ah, falls in, on, yeah. in route. Sorry, yeah. I don't think I probably mentioned that. The The reason why Solomon was traveling to, to passing by Wadi Namal was because it, he was going with his army to attack the the Queen of Sheba in Yemen. So this falls under route. Sorry, I think I should have mentioned that in, in the talk, but yeah. Mm, very interesting. Sorry, I had another follow-up question. Yes. Uh, Oh, sorry, not a follow-up, but a separate question. So, um, you you elaborated a bit on uh, you know what it could refer to when the translation is saying that a woman from the tribe of the Namal. Um, uh, it was I was quite intrigued that you you know you were talking about um, the characteristics of the ants uh, as an insect uh, society, and and the, you know how it could relate to the queen, for example, and I think. I think that's quite interesting. Um, but another character, a very typical characteristic of ant society is that female ants are usually the ones who you see all the time, the ones that are outside of their colonies, the ones that are the workers, the workers, exactly. Yes, They're the ones exactly. getting yeah, all the resources right. and everything, right? Yeah. So don't you think it could refer to any female? That's why the Quran hasn't explicitly said, you know, queen, uh, because the queen doesn't actually come out, right? It's a, it's really, no, right. it's really the females and any female, uh, they are given hierarchies as well, isn't it? Uh, as to look right, after yeah. some, some ants looking after others, you know, where they're tracking basically the lines and stuff. So it could be one of those. So which it, is it, it just a be. random woman. It could be, um, but the reason why I would say it was a um, someone official, it, it could be um, someone, an official from that, uh, a female official from that colony as well. Because remember, if someone's issuing a decree, 
only a, a ruler will issue that decree, right? That go into your homes and this, you're ba they're basically declaring a state of emergency. It's not like any random person is going to come out and say, by the way, stay in your homes, we're about to get attacked, right? It's going to be a, a royal decree, right? Or something along these lines. Or, but it could be, it could mean Namlatham means an uh, official, um, you know, a senior official from that that valley as well. It, it could well be. But the point is that some, if someone, if you're living in a in a in a community and there's a ruler, you're obviously more likely to obey the ruler, right? Or a command that comes directly from the ruler. Hence why I, I, I would say is perhaps referring to the the actual queen or the ruler of that colony. Uh, right, right, right. I see. I see. I mean, it there there is a lot of similarity and mirroring between um, ant society and you know what this what this verse is basically talking about and that's why i was just wondering whether it could be any any woman uh because in an ant society even there are certain ants which are given the duty to look after others yes so, exactly there are so so there you're are, right yes. in saying that it must be someone of of higher in the hierarchy um but it can be one of the worker ants uh it doesn't necessarily have to be the queen. Uh, it was just it was just to uh yeah, put it, it on the be, table yeah. as a possible possibility <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, as a Muslim, it hasn't mentioned specifically that. I mean, Hazul just mentions it to be a, a, um, you know, a, 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 a ruler or the, again, someone from the official, um, of that colony. So perhaps, yeah, it could be, it could well be. Okay. Yeah, I think that's Zakala. Uh, yeah, Zakala, and that's some very interesting, you know, um, dialogue about the both. So we've got some questions in the chat, um. And we've still got a bit of time to address questions. So if we move on to that, um, the next question that I have in the chat is from Munawar uh, Mujib. Um, Munawar, I'm just wondering whether you want to come off mute and ask your question. Yeah, Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa uh, Yes, my question is that uh, I have uh, read in Quran that Hazrat Salman uh, Islam ordered one of his engineer to make an exact copy of the takhat of uh, the queen. Why it was? Um, is it a? Was it a real takhat? And if it was a real takhat, then why it was so important to make its imitation? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, actually, as uh, as Solomon actually orders one of his jinn again, which is why um, the Mufassirin. Um, as a Muslim, it's quite interesting. Says that the minute that the word jinn is used in the Quran, the Mufassirin immediately go to supernatural, you know, um, being. So, as a, Solomon actually orders one of the jinn to make an exact replica of the 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 throne of the Queen of Sheba, or or that or something of that level. And I guess the meaning is that the Queen of Sheba was very. Um, particular about her, you know, grandeur and pompous. So Prophet Solomon wanted to show that actually all of this, you know, the, the, that can be replicated. Hence why he built that whole, um, the, 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 that palace or the, the area of, of glass. And there, we, there was water running underneath it to show her that actually this is just a facade. So the, act, the real thing is what's behind all of this. This material world or the material wealth doesn't actually hold any any significance that you have a throne i could make that myself over here so it doesn't actually mean anything because she was very proud and very you know um arrogant in a way and that's why Hazrat has suleiman has is, has been referred to as he was, first wrote her a letter inviting her to to towards god and then again he traveled to yemen as well as, as mentioned over here so i guess that's Probably a meaning why um, uh, he ordered for another replica of throne to be made. All right. Um, so we'll move on to the next question. I can see a few questions in the chat. So I'm going to take the um, ask um, Umer to ask um, his question. And I know Shazad's hand is up. So afterwards, I'll come to you, Shazad. So Umer, do you want to ask your question now? Yes, yeah, Salamikum. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Jazakallah. Um, uh, I'll just read it out, um, uh, if that's okay. Uh, am I right in saying that one of the uh, biggest, the biggest problems in understanding 
or the wider non-Muslim, um, non-Ahmadi Muslim Ummah is that translations of many uh, Quranic uh, verses is taken too literally too often in Marabi Sabzi. That, that's correct as well, yes. They, they take things to be, um, you know, f as exactly as it is mentioned. But like I said, as a Muslim always says that there are metaphors used in the Quran. There are metaphors used in um, divine scriptures a lot, actually. So even in the Quran, like I said, it was Yadullahi Fawqa Aidihim, that Allah's hand was over them, right? Or Wama Rameta is Rameta, Walakinna Allah Rama, that when the Holy Prophet was in battle of Badr, when he threw the, the pebbles, it wasn't actually what the Holy Prophet throwing, it was Allah throwing, right? It, it, all of these, or, or him sitting on the throne, that's a big one, especially amongst the Salafis, they really take that to be, you know, God is sitting on the throne and you can't, why do you have to interpret otherwise? So it, it is, they, they take it literally, but this is the beauty of the verse where la yamasuhu illa al-mutaharun, that only the people who are, who have been made pure. Mutaharun means those who have been made pure, made pure by Allah the Almighty. The more you increase in your, your knowledge of, you, of, of your relationship with God Almighty, the more verities of the Quran will be revealed to you. So that's why you will get to the depths of these meanings. The, the Mufassirin, the great, great Mufassirin couldn't get past the, the, these actual words, right? They couldn't get to the depths of it. But as a Muslim, I'll, you know, presented at the sea, which is very, I mean, any person on the street would be able to accept that one. But a human speaking to, to birds or to ants, that's almost laughable. I mean, it is laughable. But um, but yeah, they, they do take it literally. And again, Mufassirin have also erred in this context as well. Yes, agreed. Zakla. Zakla. So um, I'll move on to Shazad now. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Jazakallah for the talk. It's not a question, actually, it's just a point I wanted to make with regards to the uh, question that was asked earlier about hosts. So I think, um, in I've just looked it up as well, in archaic English, host just means an army. So it's basically just, just uh, I think it's in line with the style of uh, English that uh, 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 Mulvi Sher Ali Saab uh, uses. Uh, so I just wanted to add that to the the you know, conversation um oh, that's, that's really good there we go um i think manan sab asked the question but that's really good Zakla, for that. Zakla. one question i did have actually was uh this is being recorded is it going to be uploaded onto youtube or somewhere as well i joined a little bit late so i wasn't able to i'm sorry i can just jump in here so i've put the link for the previous talk in the chat and this link for this talk will also be shared inshallah onto our youtube channel so perfect. So um, we've still got a couple more minutes or so um, for some questions. So if I can invite Nasira to ask the question. Assalamu alaikum and uh, for your amazing presentation, your amazing work. May Allah bless you for this. I was just thinking about the incident uh, when, I uh, don't know if it's a specific hadith, um, where a piece of wood communicated or spoke to the Holy Prophet وسلم, saying that uh, it or the tree that the wood sourced from was hurt. Uh, and the communication went on with the Prophet, Holy Prophet وسلم, and just matching it with uh, what we've heard today about the communication between uh, Hazrat Solomon and the ant. This method or this channel of communication is obviously open to a select few which Allah deems um, worthy. But is there any other clue as to how this communication happens? Is it telepathic, spiritual? I know you've mentioned about the vibration um, uh, sense of the ant below the knee, but um, uh, and it's got no hearing. But yeah, if you could shed some light on that, please. Jazakumullah. I mean, uh, um, Prophet Solomon didn't actually speak to any ants. I mean, that's that was the whole point of the 
if I'm if I understood the question properly, the, the Prophet Solomon didn't actually speak to any ants. That's the whole um, um, difference between the Ahmadiyya perspective and the non-Ahmadiyya perspective. That the, the Wadi and Namal was actually referred to as a colony of people, um, or a tribe, settled somewhere in the Levant. I'm so sorry. Sorry. No. Um. Jazakum Allah for clearing that up. Um. What What I meant was the method of um, for example, uh, Hazrat Abu Huraira was able to, um, he, he kept a lot of uh, cats as well. The, the communication of uh, the, the method of commu communication, sorry, I understand that, what you explained earlier. Um, I don't think I was able to put my question correctly. Uh, uh, I'm sorry about that. But the communication channels between human and non-human entities, um, the the method uh, of communication, is there any other mention about that in the Quran, uh, whether it's spiritual or uh, uh, physical or telepathic? I mean, from my knowledge, there, there is no such, uh, as such, um, I mean, there's no, to my knowledge, there isn't any. And in fact, one of the, in one of the, um, one of the arguments of Hazrat Muslim in this was that if Solomon spoke to birds, what is it in birds that Allah the Almighty would need a prophet to understand them? Would would they be able to learn the intricacies of religion or of of the Sharia from those birds, or will they tell them something about Tawheed or or something about God Almighty for for Allah the Almighty to teach a prophet? Um, a language specific to an animal. So as a Muslim, <coughs> excuse me. So as a Muslim, actually raises this point: kid, why would he even need to speak to birds who are just, you know, one of Allah's many creations? It, it doesn't. It doesn't seem there. There doesn't seem to be any point or any sense behind it. So I, I would say that, I, to my knowledge, I, I, I don't know. And if there is, even in the Quran, it will be metaphorical more than than anything. But in the lifetime of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I mean, when you keep um, stay with stay with animals, um, horses, cats, etc., dogs, you do obviously build a rapport, right? That's a natural um, natural relationship, with, as is with any human. But even with animals, many a times the Holy Prophet saw a camel uh, and knew immediately that it needed water. Um, that's just a that's just a you know a natural inclination that you get when you stay with animals and he actually scolded the the owner that you you make it work too hard and don't give it enough uh, um, enough to eat so I, I don't know if you're referring to something like that but that's that's a very natural bond between uh, humans and animals you, you get that um people who keep horses people who keep cats they know they need some food right now or you know they, the dog owner will know when the dog needs to go for a walk um, and it needs to release its bowels etc 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 so that's that's just a relationship that you naturally develop with with, with animals. Jazakallah. Um, Jazakallah. Thank you. Jazakallah. So I know I know it's 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 time it's time now, but with you know an interesting topic like this and the way you've you know fantastically you know elaborated on it, it's always you know bound to run over a little bit. I, I still have a hand up, um, and. If I just invite Melissa to ask, you know, the last question before we bring the session to a close. So, Melissa, do you want to ask your question now? Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah, um, Madhubi Saab. It's been a really informative talk. Jazakallah. Um, my question, yes, I've got two sub questions, I guess. Um, the first one, the palace of pools that you mentioned before, you know, the palace of glass with the water, was that something that, uh, Prophet Suleiman and, and his people or his army created to show uh, show the Queen of Sheba sort of his might and his power. And if that was the case, was that was that the reason why she was convinced of Allah because she inevitably converted after that? And did her people then convert as well? Sorry, so that's three questions. Um, uh, yes, it, it it was it was to. Um... Again, the jinn, referring to in, in Solomon's army or in Solomon's um, command, were exceptional masons and, and artisans and who could make, you know, exceptional things or carpenters. 
um, hence why they're referred to as jinn. And just on a, before I answer the question, on a side note, even in the Urdu language, we use the word jinn. Um, a, we use it as ghosts and ghouls, etc. But we also use it very commonly that a person who's got extraordinary capabilities or, or is like, you know, it seems like he's doing something extraordinary, like Vodabanda Jinn, as in like meaning he, he just he's extremely powerful or extremely, you know, talented, etc. So even even that, I don't want anyone to to think that Jinn, you know, refers to anything towards, uh, you know, supernatural or something like this. But they did make um, uh, a, a palace of glass with water flowing underneath, meaning that they were expert craftsmen and uh, artisans. And the whole point was, and that's where it mentions in the in the Quran where the Queen of Sheba thought that there, there was water there, or it was a, it was like a like a slab um, of glass, and underneath was uh, was water flowing, and that's why she raised her 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 um, dress. And again, the Mufassirin have, have a field day with with this um, because they could see the the anklets, and they they make some incredible, um, you know, incredibly. Uh, romantic and fan fantastic uh, of seer of this whole incident that Solomon actually wanted to uh, I, don't, I don't even want to mention it but he, he had a fascination of you know getting to you know seeing some of Queen Sheba and that's why he made this but again like I said the, the Ahmadiyya perspective is that you know it it's the fact that he wanted to show her that what's on on top is not or what is you know physically that you can see that's not actually the, the whole and you know be all and end all it's actually what's behind and that's why because she was of that she had that uh nature she's very proud very proud <clears throat> sorry excuse me <clears throat> and to break that arrogance robert solomon devised you know or as in he was obviously guided by god almighty to use this sort of tactic not every prophet uses that because obviously every prophet is dealing with the adversaries according to uh, the adversary's temperament. And that's how Solomon broke through to her. About her people accepting, I don't know, I'll be honest. Um, I know she did accept. And that was probably the reason why she accepted because he matched her on every level and beyond. So I guess that broke her, her arrogance. And, you know, again, at the end of the day, she was destined to uh, accept. Um, or, you know, she was part of to be part of the uh, the fortunate ones, so she accepted. But I, I don't remember about her people. I, I'll have to check that one. Jazakallah, that's really helpful. Um, Jazakallah, and Jazakallah. I think that is that is um, all that we have time for in terms of the question and answers. Jazakallah, everyone, um, for the questions and for those ones that we've not been able to answer in this session. Um, please do reach out to Murabi Saab um, directly um, with, with those questions. Um, you know, Jazakallah again, um, Murabi Saab, for such, you know, insightful um, you know, talk. And um, uh, before, I hand over, uh, before I call on Kamal Ampa to see the closing pray, I'll just, you know, ask with Ransab whether there is any um, announcement or final yes, message with across. Just very quickly, Zakalas and Sahib is just a, a quick reminder of next week's talk. So these we've now, alhamdulillah, completed half of the seminars for this Ramadan. Next week we have another really fascinating topic, looking and really diving into Hazrat Muslim Mode's research methodology and how we use the Quran as a source for knowledge. And today we've listened to a lot of this already from Zafir Sahib's talk. Um, and next week, Dr. Mahmoud Sahib will be interrogating that further and looking at his methodology. Uh, which will be hopefully, inshallah, enlightening for everyone, especially in this month of Ramadan. Um, I think that's it for me. Zakala Sami Sahib. Jazakallah, Rizwan Sahib. Um, can I very kindly call on Kamal Ampa to lead us in silent prayer to conclude the session? Uh, please, can you join me in a silent prayer? Rabbana Afrik Alena Sobran Wasabit Akdamana Wansuna Alal Kamil Kafirin Ami. Ami. Ami.